the Evangelical Immigration Table, and the National Immigration Forum. Uh, we are excited to be sharing these different conversations from community, um, community members here in uh, North Carolina and across, um, across the state. Um, first, I would like to uh, introduce to you and welcome Kirsten Lewis, who is a program manager for Immigration Legal Services for World L Relief in Durham. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you so much, Vivian. So I today, before we get into the DREAMer legislation, really want to first address what DACA is, and then we can go from there. So the DACA program was announced just over, um, just over, oh, I'm already forgetting. I can't do math here, but it, it was announced on June 15th of 2015, I believe. And this program, no, that doesn't, no, that's not correct. 2012. 2012, thank you. I was having trouble doing math, but June 15th of 2012 and later went into effect. And the DACA program is essentially protection against deportation and work authorization for individuals who arrived to the United States before June 15th of 2007 for individuals who are either pursuing um, education or had graduated from high school or had a a GED or equivalent, and then um, that they had no lawful status when the DACA program, um, when they were applying for the DACA program, and there were other requirements as well. And so these individuals apply for DACA status include different types of evidence, and then once approved, are given two-year work authorization in that protection from deportation. And it is renewable every two years. And with the DACA program, it's there is no, like if you participated in DACA for so long, you can get a green card. There's no pathway to a green card or no pathway to citizenship with DACA. It is a temporary status. It is only valid for those two years and then it has continued to be renewed. Now, what you may have heard is that there has been a lot of litigation and a lot of arguments about the legality of the DACA program. And so September 5th of 2017 was when the Trump administration canceled the DACA program, wouldn't allow any new initial applicants. Um, and you could only certain individuals could continue to renew. And then in, in January of 2018, renewal applications were allowed to be accepted based on some litigation and an in, 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 in injunction in the courts. And long story short, um, it eventually made the, its way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said the way that the DACA program was canceled was not lawful and it was allowed to reopen. And then once it was reopened, DHS tried to, sit, tried to somewhat cancel it again, a soft cancel saying, we want to review the program to see whether or not we fully want to cancel it. That went into the courts. And then finally in December of last year, the DACA program was allowed to reopen to its fullest. Now, with the reopening of this program in last December, the eligibility requirements have not changed. So only individuals who were here in the United States before 2007, June 15th of 2007, were eligible. So even if you were a child under the age of 16 who arrived after 2007, does not mean that you were then able to apply for the for the DACA that has now reopened. And that's one of the, um, that's really one of the barriers for individuals to get legal status through the DACA program is maybe they did come here as a child, but they, they didn't come in time. Maybe they can't prove their eligibility. And so a lot of immigration advocates, including World Relief, we've really been trying to find a way to not only find permanent, more permanent status for DACA recipients, but really focus on dreamers in general. And dreamers are can be defined in so many different ways, but um, finding ways to have a pathway to citizenship for these for immigrants who are really ingrained in our society and are work working in our workforce or our students or are helping in so many different ways. And you'll hear some stories here, but with what we've been advocating for over the past few years 
has been this legislation. And right now there are currently two bills that are primary, primary bills are, are in the House and the Senate. In the Senate, there is the DREAM Act, which there have been different versions of the DREAM Act going on for years. And you've likely heard about the DREAM Act. And then there is the American Dream and Promise Act that is out of the House. And just to summarize briefly without going too much into the weeds, both of these programs will offer an opportunity for at least DACA recipients um, to eventually become conditional residents, meaning having a temporary green card, later getting lawful permanent residence, a more permanent green card, and then become citizens. For both of these bills, there are education requirements in order to become lawful permanent residents. Um, and there are a few different distinguishments, like, uh, for instance, with the American Dream and Promise Act, it also includes T TPS recipients, DED individuals, and other individuals, whereas the Dream Act is specifically focused on DACA, and the American Dream and Promise Act also in includes some um, employment eligibility in order to apply for permanent residence. But ultimately, the focus of these bills is just to give conditional residence to dreamers. And then after fulfilling different requirements, education requirements, mostly, then these dreamers can apply for the lawful, lawful permanent residence. And then in general, individuals have to show residence for at least five years in, in order to become, to apply for citizenship. So it does allow that path. And like I said, I gave two examples of the ways that they're differentiated, but really the, the, um, the bills are, are pretty similar. Now, in terms of where they are, the House has passed the American Dream and Promise Act and, and it's been sent to the Senate. And the Dream Act is still in the Judiciary Committee. So it hasn't been voted on, it hasn't been debated on. And the Senate has not, to my knowledge, has not touched the American Dream and Promise Act yet. And so um, what this means for us at World Relief and for us as Christians is really trying to find a way that we can advocate for our community, for all members of our community, and really focusing on reaching out to our senators and our Congress people and saying this, um, these types of reforms are really important to us and are really essential for our community. And here are examples of why they are important. I've been working with immigrants for the past seven years. And I will say I have met so many individuals who maybe came in 2008 and finished high school and, and were going on to community college or were working to support their families, but they're not eligible for DACA because they came one year later. And so potentially with something like the DREAM Act or the American Dream and Promise Act, this would be a way for them to get lawful status and get safety and security, not only for, for themselves, but for their family members. And so we really encourage really churches, community members to reach out to our members of Congress. If, if you're comfortable calling on the phone, I will say that if you are afraid to talk to someone personally, you can always call after hours and leave a message or write letters. And it is really important, especially as Christians, to reach out because the media and um, even the, the Hill in, in Washington, DC, they really view evangelical Christians as not being fans of immigrants, of being anti-immigrant. But we do want to show that yes, this is important to us. Immigration is important to us. And these individuals, these dreamers are parts of our community. They do deserve to have lawful status. And we are here to advocate for them so that you, Senator, you, Congressperson, can make a difference in their lives. And, and so I just have an, um, a few seconds here. Um, I want to say for those of you who are getting ready to advocate, that's great. Thank you so much for your efforts. But if you're also someone who knows people who maybe are wondering if they're eligible for DACA or if there is some sort of dreamer reform that has passed, individuals who might be interested in applying for the lawful status, we recommend individuals to either 
contact a competent immigration attorney or to reach out to a, a site that is recognized by EOIR or the Department of Justice to receive immigration services. And I'm gonna post a link here in the chat so you can have access to that list and can look and see who in North Carolina offers immigration services because it is important to have good representation. We've seen so many people in the past who have been taken advantage of by notarios or other people who don't have authorization and have been denied or even deported because of bad representation. So thank you so much for letting me speak and I hope I didn't go too much over my time and I will definitely answer questions later if there are any. Thank you so much, Christine, for um, sharing this information with the community um, about you know, what, what is DACA, um, what's going on in the House and the Senate um, to give us also perspective as to what's happening today. Um, so I just wanna remind everyone that we will have a Q&A option open at the end. Um, so if you do come up with some questions during the, the session, we ask you to please um, send them in the Q&A area and uh, we will answer them at the end. Um, but now, so I would like to, um, to welcome, we are gonna have a panel here and um, we have different people uh, just like myself, uh, just like uh, you will see all of us are community members. Uh, we all uh, you know, do something in the community today and impact not just our lives, but the lives of those that uh, we live around. And so um, we are going to, uh, to have three dreamers um, or three DACA recipients as well who will share their stories with us. And first, I would like to uh, introduce and welcome Jocelyn Casanova, um, who is originally from Veracruz, Mexico, and she is based out of the Raleigh area. So welcome, Jocelyn, um, and we'll open this space for you to share your story with us. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to our stories. My name is Jocelyn Castanova. I was born in Veracruz, Mexico, right on the Gulf. Um, I came to the States when I was three and a half years old, and I grew up with a low-income family, um, went to school, and growing up, I always wanted to be an immigration attorney, ironically. Um, I always had a niche for helping people, and that just felt like my calling. Um, in high school, I was the top of my class. I was president of many national honors societies. Um, I did all the extracurricular activities and getting into college was no issue at all, except money wise. And um, I really wanted to go to Campbell University just because um, they had a great law program. And when I was at the interview, um, they had asked me for my social security number. And up until then I had never had a need to use it or um, give it to anyone. And I was dumbfounded. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't provide that right now, but if I can just go home, I will be able to provide that for you. Um, but I think the person who was interviewing me kind of knew something was going on. I wasn't aware, but basically they just told me that at the um, right now we're not able to take your, uh, your kind, but once you have that paperwork, set with our government, then we can take you in. And I was very confused. I was distraught because Campbell was the place I wanted to go to. I had the grades and everything, but I just was missing that tiny component. So I went home, I spoke with my mom, and that's when I found out that um, I wasn't born here. It was a literally a day before graduation, and I felt like my whole world was ripped beneath me. Um, of course, I could have gotten upset at her, but, um, I wasn't. I understood why she did it. She told me that we were running away from poverty, illiteracy, crime, and other such things. And if I were to stay in Mexico, I wouldn't be where I am now. So um, I'm grateful that they took that position um, for me, even if it might have not been done in the right way at the time. But I'm super grateful for that for now because um, after high school, I wasn't able to attend college just because going to community college um, is still kind of hard with DACA. Just going to community college, I have to pay $5,000 tuition per semester versus 
paying 1000 and some change and not being able to apply for federal aid or um, any government or any loans. Um, yeah, I can apply for some scholarships, but there's many of us and the scholarships don't really cover everything. Um, I did apply to Meredith and I was able to get a scholarship there. But again, it wasn't enough to cover completely everything. And I didn't want to get more loans from my parents because they're already working so hard. So um, I got a job at a retail store. And from then I worked as a um, teacher assistant at a daycare. And each job on the next, I took a little piece and applied to the next job just so I could keep growing as a person, even though I couldn't attend college at the time. Eventually I landed with an organization called Code the Dream where they were willing to help folks like me who aren't able to go to college or afford it and teach coding. Um, that is something that my community isn't exposed to um, in Mexico, or at least where I'm from. We don't really have computers or know how technology works. So it's not like my parents knew what coding was or, you know, how to use a computer. I had to kind of learn that firsthand here. And I learned my first language, which was Ruby. Um, however, I still wanted to do that law life. So I went to work at a um, law office and I worked as a federal paralegal for a year, but I still found that um, I actually really like tech a lot better. So I landed a full ride scholarship to go to boating, uh, coding bootcamp. And I now work for a uh, company called Pendo, which I'm at the office right now. And it's a software company here in downtown Raleigh and I'm a full stack software engineer and I've been here for two years and I really love what I do. I get to work with customers across the globe in Australia, Israel, UK and um, just work on code, writing code and create something that um, can be used anywhere. And also um, coding is something that I'm very passionate about because if God forbid DACA um, gets taken away, I can take that with me as long as I have Wi-Fi. And so that's kind of why I ended up switching paths because I needed something that I could use wh wherever I am. Again, right now, you know, I've been in limbo, so I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow or the next couple months. So I just want to make sure that I have something that I can use to take care of my family and myself. Um, the big thing that I've noticed throughout this journey that has been difficult is that God has always been there with me. Um, every time that I felt that I wasn't gonna make it or I felt like I had reached a low point, um, I prayed and somehow God always managed to answer my prayers. Um, I actually go to a church nearby downtown and I can see it from um, our office window. And when I came in for the interview, I was super nervous just because I wasn't sure if I was going to get the job or not. But um, I could see the church from the window. So I was just looking at, I was like, hey, God, please, can you help me here? Like, I am so thankful if I can get this job. And yep, um, I ended up getting the job and I've been here ever since. And I'm just super happy to be here. And I want to continue to, to be here and help my family and help others um, get to this place just because a lot of uh, low income families and people of color are not really in tech. It's usually like um, the majority is like white males and I wanna be able to change that and um, share my story and share my knowledge with other folks that look like me and have the opportunity even if they can't go to college or school. So yeah, and I like sweet tea now. So um, I guess that makes me still learn. <laughs> Wow, Jocelyn, uh, this is the first time that I hear your story. And um, of course, you know, I, I can't help but get teary eyed um, and, and chills to hear uh, what obstacles you had to face because of your because of the barriers, right? Um, and you're such an inspiration um, to many. So continue sharing that story. Um, so now we are going to hear from Cruz Nunez. Uh, who is originally from Guanajuato, Mexico, and is based out of the Durham area. So welcome, Cruz. Thank you, Vivian, uh, for that introduction. So like you said, hi, my name is Cruz. I'm also a web developer, but I work for Code the Dream. Um, I make custom powerful websites to help lots of people. Uh, I also manage and teach other developers. Uh, I was born in Mexico and moved to North Carolina when I was only four. I do have DACA. Uh, I don't remember what life was like in Mexico, but my parents tell me that we were poor. 
My parents just wanted to provide more for their families, which made my dad move to the United States. My mom and me followed him about a year later. And I'm so glad that we did because I could have grown up without a father. I'm truly thankful, especially after just celebrating Father's Day. I started school in the United States and was in ESL class until the third grade. But now I'm better at English than Spanish, which is funny. I always thought it was strange how my parents said we were poor in Mexico and how we didn't have a lot in the United States, but they still always sent money back to their families in Mexico. If they could have just kept that money, I could have had more things when I was a kid, right? Maybe my clothes could have been better. Maybe I could have had more toys. But now that I look back, things weren't so bad. I was happy. I had a PlayStation and a few games. I like to just play Spyro or go outside and play with my friends. And looking back, I can see that they're providing for us, but also their families. Just like how if now my parents needed help, I wouldn't hesitate to help them. They've shown me how to be selfless and I think it has shaped who I am. Another part of my life that has shaped who I am is the church. In Mexico, my mom had the habit of going to church every week. And when we moved here, my mom took it upon herself to find a Catholic church that we could be a part of. I received my first communion in North Carolina. I did my Catholic confirmation here. At, fir at first we were just regularly attending mass, but we slowly started doing more in the church. I got involved in folk dances during winter events. My sister joined the choir because she was good at singing and my mom was the one taking her to those uh, singing lessons. Um, later, my dad joined and finally I joined. And at first I was against it because I didn't really sing. It was embarrassing and I felt uncomfortable, but eventually I saw it as another skill to learn. And now I regularly get scheduled to do Psalms by myself at the altar um, between readings. And that's another thing. My dad joined the scripture readers. And once I was old enough, I also joined the readers group. And now I also get scheduled to read scriptures at the altar during mass as well. My family and my faith are both very important to me and they help shape who I am. And about my education in school, I was a pretty good student. I was good at math and science mainly, uh, not really history and, and uh, English, um, but I got the 98th percentile on the math section of the ACT, 94th percentile of the SAT, 4.2 weighted GPA, 3.5 unweighted. And um, I also chose a lot of electives that used computers during high school, like audio engineering, web design, and drafting. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't apply early to colleges and could only get into Durham Tech. And for tuition, I almost won the Golden Door full ride scholarship. Um, and then I got runner up for a $50,000 Felicia Brewer scholarship but the winner ended up winning another scholarship. So I got that award. Then I went to community college and then I got an email about free programming classes. And I signed up because why not? It's free and you know, I've always had an interest in technology. I came to find out I'm pretty good at it. And now I enjoy creating and fixing websites. Then I entered a coding boot camp just like Jocelyn and got my tuition paid for in full thanks to Code the Dream. I graduated and have been coding ever since. Now I also helped teach others from low income backgrounds and minority groups and help change their lives as well. That's my story. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Cruz, for sharing that story and for, um, you know, congratulations on receiving that scholarship. We know how, how important those scholarships are for students like ourselves um, who have to look for other means. And, and I'm, I'm grateful and, and congratulations that you received that. Our next um, panelist, uh, her name is Fabiola Perez, and she is originally from Mexico and she is based out of Winston-Salem. So Fabiola, welcome. Hi everyone, how are you doing today? I hope you guys are doing amazing. Um, first of all, I wanna thank everyone that's watching and listening. Um, we're all here for a purpose and you know, I'm really thankful for, for that. So 
Um, again, like, like Vivian said, my name is Fabiola Perez. I am from Cuernavaca, Morelos. And I got here at the young age of seven. So I was able to go to school in Mexico. Um, I remember some stuff, but obviously as time passes, as age gets us, you know, I, I forget some things. Um, but my parents decided to bring me um, to the US and at the time I didn't understand why. Um, we didn't live terribly and I felt like, you know, I love Mexico, I was fine. But as I grew older, I found out that when I was young, my dad had been kidnapped um, in Mexico by some of his friends. So as a young child, you don't understand the trauma that that causes on a person. And my dad is a very persevering person. He always wanted to have a business. So I think that trauma of having been kidnapped at the time made him just want to move out of Mexico to feel safer, not only for himself, but for his family. So I'm very thankful for that and that he followed his dream. Um, I'm now 27, so I've been here 20 years in the States and I truly feel like this is my home. Um, I'm always really scared that one day I'm not gonna be able to be here because I truly wouldn't know what to do. Um, even though, you know, I'm Mexican and, and my roots stays very strong with me. So, but still, I, I still wouldn't know what to do because I'm, I'm very mixed and I'm, I've been here most of my life. Um, so what I do now, so I went to North Forsyth High School and through high school, I did really great. I had good grades. However, I've always been attracted to the beauty industry. I, I'm more of an art person. And even though I did really well, my teachers would always tell me, you know, why don't you want to do something else besides um, the beauty world? But this is truly what I love to do. Um, I love being in the beauty industry. Um, however, after high school, it was really hard to find just um, scholarships for the beauty industry. There's not a lot of that. Um, most of them are, if there is, they're more for like um, a four-year degree or four-year college. Um, so when I finished, I didn't go to school right after, but with time, my, my um, dreams to become an esthetician, a beautician was, were still there. And um, I went to beauty school, but I did have to pay all of it out of pocket. Um, however, I do remember that back to being in high school, when um, Obama said that he was going to you know, have DACA available for us, I was really excited and really motivated. I felt like I had a fire within me that just motivated me to want to be something because before then when I was in school and even though I was getting these good grades, I just felt like I wasn't going to be able to do anything with that because I wasn't going to be able to, if I wanted to go to a four-year school, I wasn't going to be able to do that anyways because you can't really apply or as, at that time that's how I felt. And even though my love truly is in, in a trade school type of thing, you still have to have a social security number like Jocelyn said. So I kind of felt stuck. I didn't know what to do. So having that break after high school and being able to apply for that kind of helped me motivate me, start that fire within me that I needed to follow my dreams. Um, so I've been here since. And like I said, I love being an esthetician and kind of bringing out that, um, beauty within and, and without to people. Um, so that's what I do. And I did wanna um, talk about a little bit about some of the struggles that um, I feel like a DACA recipient we face that maybe people don't know or are not aware about. Um, for example, when I was in high school, uh, you can't get your license because at the time we didn't have DACA. So people would ask me, well, why don't you just go in up, you know, do the class for getting the license? And I couldn't do it, I was embarrassed to tell my friends that, you know, I didn't have a social security number because then those questions would come up like, well, why didn't you come legally and that type of thing. And, you know, as a kid, you really don't get a choice. You kind of don't know what to say. You're a little embarrassed. So that's one of the struggles that I face. Um, another struggle that I face now as an adult is that, you know, I can't vote. I feel like I'm part of this community. I'm part of the US as an immigrant, but, I feel like my voice, you know, really can't be heard because I can't, I can't vote because I'm not a citizen. And then another thing that I faced recently is that when you have DACA, you also get higher interest rates. So for example, um, I recently applied for a refinance for my car because I have really good credit. 
And if I had a citizenship, I would be able to get like a three point something percent. And I had applied and everything. Once it came down to signing the paperwork, they're like, well, your interest rate is 7%. So you didn't tell me you were a citizen because that wasn't a question when I had to, to answer. But it goes from a 3% to a 7%. So it's the little things that sometimes we don't talk about that I want to make aware to that we struggle with. And that if we could potentially have a permanent citizenship here to be here, you know, we could be, we wouldn't have to face that. Um, so I thank you so much. And before I leave, I wanted to share a poem with you guys of how I have felt through the years being a DACA recipient. Okay, so my poem is called The Golden Cage. The bird in the golden cage sings. It sings about the distant lands it will see. The bird is grateful to his rightest owner, but it wonders when he will be free. The bird in the golden cage sings. It sings about the times he flew among the mountains. The bird is grateful to his rightest owner. He feeds him and provides a home. But the bird has grown tired of these gates of gold. The bird has grown tired of being all alone. But the bird will sing, 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 and sing because only his songs will ever be free. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the time. And I hope, you know, God continues to put me in the path to be able to tell people my story. Thank you. Wow, um, yet another inspirational story um, and, and truly, um, you know, a way to share with everyone some of those little things that we don't think about, um, you know, like in, in high school, um, not being able to take driver's ed um, or being able to drive at such a young age like everyone else in our classroom or our classmates did. So thank you for sharing those perspectives, Fabi. Um, and so now we would like to open this opportunity for questions and answers from the audience. Um, if you can, if you would type out any questions in the Q&A or in the chat, um, we would be happy to, um, to answer those. So at this moment, I'd like to invite uh, Cruz, Fabiola, and Jocelyn to, um, to turn their videos on, their cameras on, and I will ask um, a few questions and feel free to answer them. Um, however, if, if one of you is more inclined to answering them or if you don't wanna answer, that's fine as well. Um, but the first question is, um, so you all have shared you have DACA. Um, what are some of the limitations that you have faced personally even with DACA status. And we heard Fabi share a little bit about that with the high interest rates. So um, Jocelyn or Cruz, is there anything else that you would like to add about some of the limitations you've personally faced even with DACA? Um, sure, I can jump in. Um, so aside from college was one of the bigger issues that was limiting me from attending, like I said, um, in North Carolina, DACA recipients have to pay out-of-state tuition rates, so just going to community college is very expensive. Um, and I did try to work three jobs and go to college at the same time, paying the out-of-state tuition rate, but it was nearly impossible to work around the clock and do good at school at the same time. So I found myself in this vicious cycle of like being overworked and not doing good and doing good and not working enough. Um, the other thing, I recently tried to apply for a house, and I know the house market is very crazy right now, and I'm literally just doing it to help my parents, but um, like Fabiola said, um, it's kind of hard to get certain loans. Um, I had applied to um, State Employees Credit Union, and they were like, you're not a citizen, so we can't help you out. And um, so my options of where I can apply and requirements are a lot stricter with folks who are resident and citizens, unfortunately. So just moving is kind of hectic and I have to wait longer and have to jump through higher hoops. So it can be a bit frustrating, but it is what it is. Thank you, Cruz. Yeah, off the top of my head, um, like Jocelyn said, I've also had to deal with out-of-state tuition, and I've also I'm also trying to get a house in the near future. And I've heard that you know 
people with DACA oftentimes get higher interest rates on mortgages. Um, another thing is that you have to renew every two years and spend $500 for them to process your application. Um, also about the driving thing, I learned how to drive when I was 10. My dad, you know, just took me to the park and had me practice in the parking lot. Um, and basically I was driving illegally for, for like a year or two until I was 18 when I was able to get my license thanks to DACA. Thank you. Um, something I would like to add is that uh, the, another struggle that we face as DACA is being in lingo. And for example, during the Trump administration, if I would have had advanced parole, I would have been able to see my, um, gone to see my grandma because she passed. And during that time, I was not able to go to Mexico and actually say goodbye to her. So that's a struggle that we face, just not having anything permanent. Either we're some, sometimes we have certain changes that it doesn't allow us to do certain things. And then sometimes we are. And just saying goodbye to my grandma would have been amazing. And in the original plan, I would have been able to. And unfortunately, it was it was through the Trump administration. So I wasn't able to do that. Thank you for, for jumping into that, Fabiola. That's actually one of our next questions is, have you ever gone back to visit your parents, your hometown, or what your parents would consider their hometown? Um, and what was that like? If not, why not? And you touched a little bit about, um, you know, the, the process of that. So, um, Jocelyn Cruz, Fabiola, is there anything you would like to share about whether you've been able to visit um, parents' hometown, um, what was it like? And if not, why not? Yeah, I can uh, go ahead and speak. Um, I remember um, back when I was a kid and uh, my parents made me talk to my grandparents on the phone and I was very shy, I didn't know what to say. Um, they would say that, like, Crucito, do you remember um, when you left, uh, you promised to come back once you were like a man or, you know, had a full uh, like mustache or like beard or whatever. And um, apparently that's something that I promised and the time has come, I have the facial hair ready, but I have not gone back to Mexico yet. Um, but luckily uh, my fiance is a US citizen and we plan to get married soon. So hopefully we can um, do something right and hopefully I can move out of the stage of DACA um, and be able to travel freely. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to share anything about traveling out of the country? Um, sure, I can add. I, I feel like I might be one of a few, but I have not left the country since. Um, even when it was available, I didn't go, not because I had a reason to or not, but I was just kind of scared because um, DACA has always been kind of in limbo and, you know, there was different rumors like if you went, then once a uh, law comes in, you're not going to be able to apply for a citizenship or if you don't go. So I just wasn't ever really sure if I should go or not. And I just chose to not go outside of the country. Um, but I feel like it might have been a bad decision just because of like how the law is right now. If I were to hypothetically get married and apply because I don't have an advanced parole uh, timestamp, um, it's going to be a lot harder. I'm going to have to leave the country for who knows how long and then come back. So my situation might be a bit more complicated. So right now I am not counting on marriage and I wouldn't marry just for that. Um, I'm counting on the legislation to change. And, you know, who knows if that's going to happen or not. I'm hopeful that it would, but if not, then I'm at a loss. Thank you. Um, so just for, for people to know, advanced parole is kind of a permission to travel um, where anyone who um, in, in this case, DACA recipients um, have to apply for, and then um, immigration kind of services decides whether they grant you to leave the country um, and return lawfully. Now, um, there's a lot of um, instances where you can get held up 
at airports um, because they're trying to um, just go over a lot of paperwork and a lot of times people uh, have feared that they will may not be able to return as this advanced parole um, allows. So um, just so everyone understands what that is, um, you do have to apply for it and it has to be for legitimate reasons. You can't just say, I want to go travel outside of the country. It has to be for reasons like Fabiola said, um, one of the reasons would be to go visit family who is ill um, and uh, in their deathbed. Um, so I also share that sentiment with you, Fabiola. Both of my grandmothers passed away while I was here in the States and I was unable to go see them. Um, but yeah. um, so yes, Cruz. I have another thing to add about visiting Mexico. Um, I do have a younger sister who was born in the United States and she's traveled to Mexico twice. I think once when she was like 16 and once when she was 18 and both times she loved it. Like even though the environment is really different. She just loves all the people there and getting to meet, you know, relatives. Um, Cause in the United States, we don't, well, at least I don't really have that. So I, it's just like my immediate family and um, it's just nice to meet them. Thank you. So um, I want to invite back uh, Chris, uh, Kirsten to actually answer one of the questions. Um, and so, one of the questions is how can we in North Carolina's community support um, us, right? How do we support DREAMers, DACA recipients? Um, can you answer that for us? Yeah, and I think one of the main things to do is to advocate for reform. Now, um, so Senator Burr will soon be leaving office, um, so that is a potential opportunity that he may vote differently than the rest of the Republican Party. But a lot of our focus in terms of advocacy has actually been on Senator Tom Tillis's um, with his office because he has historically not always um, voted on the same page as the rest of the Republican Party. There have been votes where he has gone astray. And even though he has, he's not always the most immigrant friendly in some of his rhetoric. In terms of how he votes, he is more likely to, he would be more likely of the two to vote along the lines of um, positive change for immigrants. Not saying that, that that is necessarily gonna happen, but if we as a community, especially the Christian community, because we are technically here in the South, um, Christians are very big down here, go ahead and let him know this is what our Christian communities want, then that can help persuade him if and when anything does come to the floor, then he may be more likely to vote one way or the other. I think another thing is also just looking for opportunities to, you know, donate money or like help pay for someone's DACA renewal or initial DACA application or their DACA scholarships, like give money to those organizations because like, um, I can't remember who mentioned it. I think it was Cruz. It's almost $500 every two years for the application. It's expensive and that's not taking into consideration any fees for legal representatives. So those are two steps. And then I think the third is just, if, you're, if you know someone who's applying for DACA for the first time, walk alongside them and help them like find some of their documents. They need proof for the past 14 years. So they may not be know necessarily how to contact the schools to get the records or contact the health department, like find ways to walk alongside them if they, if they are unsure of what to do. So those are some of the ways that we've, we've um, used the community at, um, in our office. Thank you, uh, Kristen, for that. And um, so one thing I, I would also add is, um, you know, creating, aside from, uh, you know, supporting DACA renewals, um, making donations to organizations that do that um, also for, for scholarships, I would say creating a space for these kinds of conversations. Um, I think, you know, it, it's even though DACA um, started in 2012, there are still many people who don't know about what we face. Um, and so I think it's really important to see, you know, these are, these are the people that you see here in front of you. This is us, right? Um, 
who make up a part of the community. And um, you may have never known that uh, we, we pay in higher interest rates uh, when wanting to purchase a home and so, um, or other different things. So I think creating spaces um, for these conversations to, to also bring up to light what is truly happening. Um, the, the next question that was asked is, you know, share some of the name of current legislation. And I think we, um, Kristen did that, you know, with reaching out to uh, Senator Tom Tillis. Um, and, uh, but I don't know if you'd like to add anything else to that, Kristen. I think the, the two that are primary bills that are in the House and the Senate are right now are the DREAM Act and the American Dream and Promise Act. Now, at this point, we don't think that either of these bills would pass in their entirety, which is why we as an organization are being more general in our advocacy and just saying we would like reform for dreamers in whatever way that would look like. But those are two bills. If you'd like to look up and learn more, you are definitely free to do that. And that can guide your decision about how to advocate yourself. Thank you. So um, one of the questions here is also, um, where is home for you guys? Um, would you, how would you define how you feel about the United States? So I know some of you guys have already shared, you know, you, Fabiola, you shared, you don't know what it would be to go back, um, but where is home for you guys? Um, I would honestly have to say that it is here because I, like I said before, I wouldn't know what I would do when, if I had to go back. Um, also, the industry that I am in, I personally think that, you know, honestly, you just get paid better here as well. I, I feel more of a professional where they're in Mexico, um, even not, not just in my industry, but as just teachers. Some teachers don't get paid as well. And it's just like, the lifestyle that you're used to. I'm also a mom of a nine-year-old and my son was born here. So I do want him to, to be here. So just having my family here, my son here, um, I love Mexico and I would visit, but I would definitely, I want to stay here. <laughs> Thank you. Cruz, Jocelyn, would you like to add anything else or? Yeah. Um... I would definitely say that North Carolina is my home. Um, you know, I came to the United States when I was only four years old. Um, I had just celebrated my four, fourth birthday in Mexico and then a few days later I was gone. Um, and I actually don't have any memories from Mexico. My first memories are actually from crossing over to the United States. I remember we were like, you know, in a river and I was like inside of a tube for like of like big tires because I couldn't swim and um, I remember also being inside of a hot van under a carpet so like, like jam packed with a bunch of people in there um, but yeah I grew up here I've been here since very young and my sister was born here and we both grew up here um, we both are you know better English speakers than Spanish um, you know, I've done well in school and I've found a job and a fiance. So I've, I've laid my roots here. Um, this is home for me. Um, and I guess to close out that question, I, um, yes, I am Mexican, but I also consider myself American. Um, I may have not been born here necessarily, but I have roots here, you know, just like a seed is planted and it grows. I was raised here, seasoned here with the North Carolinian ambiance, you know, the, the Southern tea, the biscuits, the barbecue. I, can't, I still don't like barbecue, I'm sorry. But, you know, I, you know, I look around and this is home. Like I see friends and family, um, I have a dog here. Um, you know, I can just walk to the park and, go out and you know just I love it here and I can't just the thought of having to leave here to go to a country which I haven't been back since I was three breaks my heart um if I have to you know I will have to go there but it's going to be very hard on me um the culture's different 
than it is here. And I'm just super grateful and happy to be here, um, you know, going to church, just everything that I do know and love is here. Um, they don't have Southern food in Mexico. So I'm definitely going to miss that. <laughs> Thank you for closing us out with that question, Jocelyn. Um, you know, it's, I think we've all shared that we're, we're all kind of ingrained at this point. Uh, we came at a young age. Uh, we don't remember many things, uh, but this is, this is where we are. And this is where we're already making an impact, making a difference in our community. Um, so I think, you know, like you said, th this is home for all of us. Um, I, I do want to just, uh, and, and I think um, Dani Vives, um, I see your question and it is, uh, there are lots of parts to your question. I would like to um, offer an opportunity to maybe share some, uh, share some answers via email. Um, but I think one thing to note for everyone is that, you know, um, DACA recipients and uh, dreamers are not just Hispanic Latinx individuals. Um, it is people that come from uh, other countries outside of the United States. So it could be people from Europe. It could be people from, um, from Africa. It could be people from all over the world that is not a US territory or the United States. So it is um, um, inclusive of everyone and everyone who is an immigrant um, to the United States. So just wanna highlight that part as well. Um, and so, um, I'm more than happy to um, send you an email back, Dani, and, and help answer that question. Now, um, I would like to just bring up the one last question on here. Maybe, Kirsten, you can answer this. Um, can a person who arrived before they were 18 and is now an asylum seeker apply for DACA now? So the fact that they are an asylum seeker isn't necessarily relevant. The important thing is, were they in the United States before June 15th of 2007? And were they under the age of 16 when they entered? And when the time DACA came around, were they under the age of 31? So there are, there are a few eligibility requirements. There's also an education requirement. I would, I would recommend that you don't necessarily do the analysis that you um, recommend that this person get a legal evaluation to see if they are eligible for DACA or not, because I can't, I can't really tell with the information that is provided. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm actually sharing just just so for reference to the USCIS um, kind of information about DACA and what the requirements are and all of that. Um, but like Kristen said, it would be beneficial for for them to look for legal counsel um, to know exactly. Um, every case is completely different um, for every single one of us <laughs> here. Um, and so, but I, I would like to thank you all for creating, um, for being here, for being vulnerable enough and, um, and valiant enough to share your stories um, of how successful you are, how successful you have become, even though through those circumstances, um, even though through those barriers that um, have posed in front of all of us, um, we still are here um, demonstrating that, you know, it has been tough, uh, but we have found ways um, to, to find a pathway maybe not necessarily the pathway we were um, wanting it to be, but we found a pathway that we are happy with and passionate about. So um, I thank you all for sharing your stories. And, um, and again, um, we just want to, uh, to thank you for the time and thank you for the people that also created space to learn more about this, um, this work or this, um, what's happening in the United States about dreamers and DACA recipients. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, for sharing with us what's happening and um, how people can become advocates with this work. And we do want to let people know that this will be, uh, this was recorded and um, we will be sharing the link um, with others and feel free to share that with other people as well who may have not got an opportunity to join in today. So um, thank you everyone, uh, have a great day and uh, let's be advocates together. <laughs>